All right. Aloha. Good morning to those of you who've uh, walked in a little bit late or joined us late. Uh, if this is your first time, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor at International. We're together. We aim to help people love God, love people, serve, and engage the world. And I'm excited uh, to be starting a new sermon series today, as, as Josh already shared with you and through that new song. You've probably picked up. It's Psalm 23, and it begins with the writer's clear and famous declaration, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, in the opening chapter of his book, Traveling Light, Max Lucado uh, talks about Jean Van de Velde. He's a professional French golfer who is famous for one of the most memorable endings to a sporting event in history. It took place in 1999 at, uh, during the British Open at Carnoustie, Scotland. Now, the Frenchman came to the final hole with the lead. Coming into hole 18, he was up by three strokes over the next nearest competitor. That meant that all he needed to do was score six on this par four. Score a six on a par four. That means a par four means it normally only take four shots to get it in the hole, but six will be okay. He'll still win. Now, I am not a good golfer. Andy Oishi can attest to that. <laughs> I am not a good golfer. And I can shoot six on a par four. All right? My mother can shoot six on a par four. Jean Vandeveld should be able to make six on a par four with a slipper and a pool noodle. This should be easy. All he needs is a six on a par four. Now, it is a tricky hole. I actually have a, a picture of it here. It is crossed three times by a marshy creek, or what the Scots call a wee burn. Now, going with a driver, that is your longest club, the one that can hit it the farthest, is pretty risky on this hole. There's very narrow landing area, and as I already said, there's this marshy creek all over. So uh, it's windy. There's the wee burn, it's wee deep, so don't flirt with it. But the French love to flirt, don't they? So Van de Velde goes to his bag and pulls out the driver. Everybody's jaw hits the ground. What is he doing with that club in his hand? I mean, the smart play is to just hit a little wedge there to the beginning, hit a second wedge to the second one, and hit a third wedge onto the green. You got three putts. You're making it in six. Perfect. You win. Be smart. Keep it in the grass. Jean Van de Velde takes the driver, swings as hard as he can, and slice off to the right into the very thick rough. Not good, but he can still recover. Take a wedge, take your medicine, hit it back into the fairway, the short grass, hit it onto the green, you're still lying three on the green. You can do this, right? Logic says, don't go for the green. Golf 101 says, don't go for the green. Every Scot in the gallery is saying, aye, laddie, don't go for the green. <laughs> Jean Vandeveld says, oh, mais oui, I am going for the green. He takes a two iron, one of the hardest clubs to hit, in a golf bag, walks into the rough, and whack, whee, bloop, into the water. Not good, not good. Spectators are silent, most out of respect, a few in prayer. And what he should do is now take the golf ball, drop it, take a stroke penalty, put it in some short grass, put it onto the green close, You're, you can still do this. Instead, Vandeveld decides... I'm going to hit it out of the water. Now, it is at least ankle, above his ankles deep. So you're talking eight inches deep. It's sitting at the bottom of the wee burn. And he's taking a club out there. Now, thankfully, his caddy protested so much, and he talked him out of it. He put his shoes and his socks back on, climbed back out of the wee burn, dropped the ball, and decided to just play it safe. Clearly shook, he shanks that next shot and puts it into the sand trap. Now he's laying five, and he's not even on the green yet. So what he needs to do just to tie the next player is he has to now chip it on and put it in. 
And to the great relief of the civilized world, Vandeveld does make a seven on the whole. But the wee burn took its toll on his confidence, and he lost in the playoff. My dad likes to say that golf does not build character, it reveals it. You want to know who a person is, take them golfing. You'll find out. And this moment reveals a lot about Vandeveld. I mean, why didn't he just do the smart thing? Why did he make life so difficult for himself? Why did he take driver? Why did he hit the two iron? Why must, must he be so, so showy, so prideful, so self-driven? Later on, his caddy would say that, well, Jean and I, we, we love the show too much. Now, when I look at Jean Vandeveld, I get a very uncomfortable image of myself because I have done the same kind of things. Now, I may not have hit a driver instead of a seven iron for the British Open, but all I needed to do was apologize, but I had to argue. All I needed to do was listen, but I chose to open my mouth. All I needed to do was be patient, but I chose to take control. All I needed to do was have courage. I chose to give in to fear. All I needed to do was to tell the truth, but I lied just to protect myself. All I needed to do was to give this situation to God, but no, I, I chose to try to fix it myself. Why so often do I grab driver? Why don't I leave the driver in the bag and listen to God? Because like the infamous Frenchman, I have too much stubbornness, too much independence, too much pride, too much self-reliance. I want too much show. I don't need any help. I don't need any advice. I don't need a caddy. Certainly don't need a shepherd. I got it. Thank you. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Can anybody else relate? Surely Jean and I are not the only uh, self-reliant, independent types in the room or online. In fact, I would venture to guess that uh, to some degree that describes every single one of us. We all have this problem. And that's not just my opinion. Scripture actually says as much. Isaiah 53 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Now, the Bible often compares us with sheep, and if you know anything about sheep, then you know this is not a compliment. <laughs> this is not a flattering metaphor, as Josh already told us. If you don't know much about sheep, here's three reasons why this is not a compliment. First of all, sheep are dumb. Sheep are dumb, seriously, if, you, if you've ever been around them. Uh, I happened to grow up in an area like Josh that uh, there were a lot of farms and sheep around. I had several friends who had sheep, and we'd sometimes, before we could play or do whatever we wanted, we'd need to go move the sheep from one paddock to another or go do stuff. And they are just so stubborn, so obstinate, uh, and they, of course, didn't know me, so they just ran the opposite direction from me all the time. I'm like, I'm trying to help you, but they're like, no, I don't need you. They're just, they're just so dumb. They couldn't figure anything out on, on their own. They, you can't teach a sheep tricks. Like, have you ever been to a circus with sheep in it? No, no. Completely unimpressive. Dumb animals. They're not going to be part of that. Th their basic function for you and for me seems to be to put us to sleep, right? If, if you want to check out, the sheep is your animal. If you want to dissociate from reality. Sheep are not very bright. Therefore, they need a shepherd to care for them. Secondly, sheep are defenseless. I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks, and I'm actually not sure there's a more defenseless animal in all of creation that I can come up with that is less capable of taking care of itself. Sheep have no fangs, no claws. They cannot outrun their predators. Their bite is good for grass, and that's really about it. And often when they're afraid, sometimes they'll run away, and if they don't, at other times they'll just freeze or fall over and play dead like a possum which, of course, makes things very easy for the coyote or wolf or whatever is chasing them. The, the comedian and author Ken Davis, he actually grew up on a farm, and he tells a true story of a time when he was a young boy, and he was uh, coming outside the barn, but he happened to see in the shadow that one of their sheep was walking alongside the barn, coming to the corner. He's like, oh, it'd be fun if I scared the sheep. 
So he waited, he waited for the sheep, and then he jumped out of the door and went, boo! And the sheep fell over and died. (laughs) True story. The sheep fell over and died from a boo. Sheep are defenseless and they are dumb. They need a shepherd to guide them and to protect them. They can't take care of themselves. Not only that, but sheep are also really dirty. Sheep are dirty. Uh, A cat can clean itself. So can a dog. Birds can take baths. But sheep usually don't. They get dirty, and they're quite happy to stay that way, with little, little dirt and little dung pellets hanging out from all of their fur. They actually need someone to clean them. Other animals also shed their coats very naturally, not the sheep. They can't even do that. They need a shepherd to shear them. All right, so, so they're dumb, they're defenseless, and they're dirty. I don't want to be a sheep. I don't want to be associated with them. Yet the Bible says that is the mirror that the animal kingdom is holding up to you and to me. That of a sheep. Unable to learn and keeps making the same mistakes. Needing to be protected. Unable to take care of itself. Can't even attain to the life that it truly wants. We need to be guided. And we are unable to clean ourselves on the inside. We, too, need to be washed by someone else. Okay, fine. I guess it hits a little closer to home than I want it to. We are sheep, you and me. And sheep cannot shepherd themselves. They need somebody else to do it. Neither can I, and neither can you. You can't shepherd yourself. If you hear nothing else I I say, it's get this idea. That you can't shepherd yourself. You as a sheep cannot be your own shepherd. When we try to do that, the Bible says we go our own way. Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray when we go our own way. Sheep get lost when they try to get their own way. And the same is true of us. We can't shepherd ourselves. We need a shepherd, someone else to help us, lead us, clean us, protect us, guide us. You can't shepherd yourself. You need a shepherd. And I think deep down, we all know this. We all admit this. Not usually out loud, but there's got to be a reason why Psalm 23 is so well known and so beloved. It might even be the most famous passage in the entire Bible because there's something in our hearts that connects and resonates with David's when he declares that he not only needs, but he has found a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Psalm 23, 1. Now, the Bible scholar James A. Johnston says, this is really interesting. It's it's significant that David is calling the Lord his shepherd, because in the ancient world, a king was called the shepherd of his people. The main metaphor here is actually one of a king that was used in the ancient world world. Israel certainly thought David was their shepherd. You can even see this language in 2 Kings chapter 5 when David comes to uh, be anointed as king. The people of God rejoice, and the phrase is that God has made David a shepherd over them. But David, who is the shepherd of Israel, seems to be self-aware enough to know that he is also a sheep. He is also a human, and he knows that he needs an even greater shepherd to take care of him. So the Israelites rejoiced that God was leading David and David was leading them, so that through David, God, Yahweh, was also shepherding Israel. Now, the entire psalm is really based on those first few words. The Lord is my shepherd. Everything else that David says is just him explaining and exploring the implications of this statement, that the Lord is his shepherd. Now, this is very famous phrasing, the Lord is my shepherd, goes all the way back to the King James Version translation in the 1600s, but Hebrew scholars today point out that this might not actually be the best translation of what David actually wrote. It's not the most literal way to understand the original phrase. This might actually be a more accurate translation. It is that Yahweh shepherds me. 
Why is that significant? I know this is a little less familiar, but this is more accurate, they say, for two reasons. First of all, he didn't say that God is his shepherd, though that's obvious and true. He doesn't use a noun. He uses a verb. And he uses a verb that says this is happening on an ongoing basis. You see, Yahweh is not just a shepherd in title, not just like CEO, way up there in the glass office. Yes, he's the CEO. Yes, he's aware of my existence. But way, way out there somewhere, I have a shepherd. That God is is just somebody who bears that title. He says, no, 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 no. He's actively and ongoingly shepherding me. David believed that God was knowing, leading, feeding, and protecting him all the time. That doesn't come across in the way we use it as a noun as clearly as when we use it as a verb. The second thing you may notice is different is that the Lord, capitalized, is actually a substitution for God's personal name. It's kind of translating tradition to insert the Lord in a place where Yahweh is actually written. That's one of those things that kind of goes back to the King James Version and a decision that was made 400 years ago that everyone's kind of scared to break with that tradition today to actually write what the text says, which is Yahweh. Sometimes when my wife and I read our Bibles together, as we do most mornings, she can attest, sometimes I kind of get tired of the Lord, and I just say Yahweh. Why? Because I want to read his name. I want to say his name. There's a difference between a name and a title. The Bible here says Yahweh, not Adonai, which is the word for the Lord. Now, the name Yahweh might feel, feel different or foreign to some of us, but it was a word rich with meaning in David's time. Now, he chose to use this word, I think, intentionally. He, he could have said um, El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. He could have called him El Elyon, God Most High, El Olam, God Everlasting, El Roy, the God who sees, but he didn't. He used Yahweh. This was God's personal and relational name, not a title, a name. Do you sense the familiarity that is there in Yahweh? Like, for example, you can call me a preacher or a pastor or a husband or father or a golf hack, and all of those would be accurate descriptions I might call you a mother or a father, a banker, a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a janitor, or an artist, a veteran, or a student, or homemaker, and and those may describe you, but those are not your name. If you want to call me by my name, you say, Scott. If you want to call me by my name and make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, you yell, Scotland Douglas! And I will respond. (laughs) If you were David and you wanted to call God, not by a title, but by his personal, familiar name, you write Yahweh. And it simply means, I am who I am. It is the name that God revealed himself as when he spoke to Moses. And this was different from God's in the ancient world. Gods in the ancient world, they were known and defined by by their abilities or maybe by something they created or did. You'd have, for example, the god of war or the god of agriculture or the god of thunder or the god of blood or the god of the Nile. But Yahweh says, no, 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 no. You can't define me by the things I have made. I am above that. I am beyond that. I'm not defined by anything or anyone. You can't just say, well, God is is good because he is that, but he's so much more than that. You can't just say God is just. He is that, but he's also so much more than that. He simply is who he is. There's nothing else that can define God. Rather, God is the one who defines everything else. He is. He is the uncaused, ungoverned, and unchanging God over all creation. I am who I am, Yahweh. And he is amazing in who he is. He is completely sufficient in and of himself. He needs nothing and no one. This is the God who wants to be 
a shepherd to his people. Yahweh says he will take care of you and me if we will allow him to. He promises that we'll lack nothing. We'll experience his sufficiency. You might say, Scott, I'm a Christian and I lack things. I don't have a job right now. Or it's in jeopardy. I need money. I have relationship problems. God, I have sin issues. Lord, my marriage is struggling. Lord, there's this addiction. I have this problem with my kid. God, I have lack. I don't have peace. I don't have wholeness in my life. I get that. Me too. We do lack things. But those who are in Christ lack wants, not needs. Now, you may be familiar with the more famous King James version of this translation, which says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, one of the reasons it's important to have more, you know, new translations as time goes on is because language changes. 400 years ago, wants referred to needs. <laughs> it doesn't refer to the way we read that today. We say, well, I won't have any wants. Yes, sign me up for that. I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. God, it's my genie. No, that's not what he's saying. It's not saying God gives him everything he wants. Rather, he's saying God provides all that he needs. I mean, a sheep does lack things. A sheep lacks opposable thumbs, a Netflix login, a nice Tesla. Like, sheep don't have those things. But they may want those things. But they lack them. But they lack nothing that they need. Those whom Yahweh shepherd lack nothing that they ultimately need for all of eternity. Now, God knows that you and I cannot shepherd ourselves. He's not disappointed in his sheep that need to be sheared, that need to be corrected, that need to be led. He knows that we can't shepherd ourselves because he didn't create us to shepherd ourselves. He's not surprised by this. He didn't create you to provide for all your own needs. God did not make you self-sufficient. Rather, he made you to be in a relationship with him where he can lead and care for you out of his self-sufficiency. He made you to be in a relationship with him. He wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. He wants to lead and to guide, to feed, and to protect you from harm. Yahweh wants to shepherd you. The decision you and I have is if we're going to allow him to do that, as David did. Now, I might say, well, Scott, I don't know how to do that. How do I allow God to be my shepherd? How would I become part of his flock? What does that even mean? I mean, following Yahweh as my shepherd, that just feels so kind of foreign and distant. Well, I get that. Because the truth is that Yahweh is kind of a bit distant from us. The Old Testament presents him as the almighty spiritual being who's over all of creation, and we cannot reach him, which is why he had to come down to reach us. And he did that fully and completely in the person of Jesus. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. If Yahweh might seem distant and unfamiliar to you, look at Jesus, the perfect image and representation of the invisible God. See, in David's time, the closest you could come to knowing God was using the name Yahweh. That's how he had revealed himself up to that point. But you and I have a privilege that we get to look back in time and we get to be on this side of the cross, this side of Jesus, we get a much clearer understanding of who Yahweh is. It's Jesus. And Jesus says some really beautiful and really important things about himself that say as much. In John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd, and I and the Father are one. See, Jesus, like David, kind of occupied this, this dual role of both sheep and shepherd. Jesus is both the son of David and the son of God. He is both fully human and fully divine. Jesus fills both these roles, right? He shows us what it's like to live as a sheep, 
He models the sheep life for us, perfectly trusting and following his father. But he is also the good shepherd. He is the father being made known through flesh, the father heart of God being shown to us. He shepherds and cares for his followers, his disciples, his bride, his church. Jesus also says in John 10, verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. If you got a few extra minutes this week, and since it's a pandemic, I'm sure you will. You can't go anywhere. Read Psalm 23, and right after that, read John chapter 10. You are going to see a ton of overlap between these two chapters. Why? Because I think John 10 is what Psalm 23 is ultimately pointing toward. Psalm 23 is ultimately pointing us forward in the Bible to Jesus. To quote the scholar James A. Johnston a second time, he just says it so well. He says, Psalm 23 is fundamentally a psalm about Christ. David was not only a king, he was also a prophet, meaning he was somebody who spoke God's words to God's people. His life and his words point forward to Christ. See, this psalm isn't just about David and Yahweh. This is a psalm about us, in Jesus Christ. And so for the 21st century reader, as I said, we, we have the privilege of knowing more than David knew, of having a clearer picture than he did. If Yahweh is a shepherd to his people and Jesus is Yahweh, right, then it follows that we can rightly substitute Jesus and his name into this text. For Christians in the 21st century, Jesus is our shepherd. Therefore, we will lack nothing. Nothing, because God says he has given us all that we need in his son. And this is why, very rightfully so, for believers, Psalm 23 is a message of comfort, of hope, and of encouragement, and of rejoicing for Christians. Psalm 23 is ultimately pointing us forward to Jesus, the good shepherd. We're going to see this over and over again as we progress through this over the next few weeks. But if this is true, that Jesus is our shepherd, that this is what the whole Bible is pointing toward, then it's an important question I just need to ask you. Is Jesus your shepherd? And you might have different answers. You might say, yes, absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. You might say, no, he's not. I'm still checking him out. Don't know if I want to be. That's awesome, too. So glad you're here. And there might be others of you who go, ah, maybe? I don't know. I kind of have some, a relationship with him. I, I talk to him. I pray to him. I kind of believe in him. I'm, but I don't know. What does that mean, that Jesus is my shepherd? How, how would I know if he's my shepherd or not? Well, it's not meant to be a mystery, it's not meant to be just like this completely ethereal thing of like, well, he's my shepherd. Well, what does that mean or look like? Jesus himself told us what that looks like. Go back to John 10, 27. What does he say about shepherding his sheep? He says this, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So he says there are three things that are true of his relationship with his sheep. Three things that are true of his sheep. Three things that they will do if Jesus is their shepherd. So this is true of you. If, you. if you say he is your shepherd or you want him to be your shepherd, this is a picture of what that looks like. The first thing Jesus says is they listen to him. His sheep listen to him. Do you listen to Jesus? To God in the flesh, do you read his word where he speaks to us? Do you care about his message? Do you pray? If you are his sheep, you will listen to his voice. When, when you were a kid, were you ever in a noisy room and you heard your parents call out to you? You heard them like say your name. And even though the room is noisy, you could hear it. You could pick out your parents' voice. You could pick out your name being called and you listen to it, right? When, when your mom calls you, you hear it, you listen. Now, your dad, he doesn't even need to call you. He just like clears his throat, <clears> throat> three blocks away, and you hear it, <laughs> shape up. They're your parents. You're in a relationship with them. They're the authority in your life when you're a kid. You listen to them. 
It's that same way with our shepherd, with Jesus. His sheep listen to his voice. They want to know what he says. They want to hear him speak. They want to spend time in his word, in prayer. And they listen to him. But the second thing Jesus says they'll do is they trust him. Now, he uses the word know. He says he knows his sheep and his sheep know him. Scholars tell us that word for know, ginosko in the Greek, describes a, a personal, intimate familiarity with something or someone. Right, so this is a word that's more than just an acquaintance or more than just mere assent to something. It's, it's a deeper knowledge. It's used constantly in the New Testament of knowing God or knowing Christ. It's trusting him. It's knowing who he is. And because we know who he is, his sheep trust him, trust that he will take care of them, that we will lack nothing. But the promises of Jesus and the promises of Psalm 23 are no good to those who don't trust him, who don't trust the one saying them. There's a lot of people who probably take some maybe false comfort from this chapter, who read Psalm 23 and go, oh, this is for me. It's like, well, but do you, do you listen to God? Do you read his word? No, 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 but this is for me. I'm not sure, because it's to those who listen to his voice, to those who trust him. Now, our family uh, recently joined the ranks of uh, the, uh, many other people who seem to be getting dogs this year. I think they're called pandemic puppies, because it's like a thing. Well, we joined that thing. Uh, we adopted Toby, a Maltese Yorkie mix from the Humane Society, and when we first got him, he obviously didn't know what to make of us. He didn't know who we were, what was going on. But it's been a few weeks now. And after a while, he's now learned to trust us. He knows who we are. He even listens to us most of the time. And when I come home from work, when I open the door, he hears my voice. He gets all excited, comes up and wagging his tail. He knows me. He trusts me. We're familiar now. He's my dog. I'm his owner. He, he trusts Fiona and I to take care of him and to protect him from our daughters who often smother him a little too much with their love and affection. <laughs> He's like, please save me. We know Toby. We feed Toby. Therefore, Toby trusts us like a sheep trusts a shepherd, like Christians trust Christ. So do you trust Jesus? One way to know if you're a sheep or not. Because Jesus, sheep will, tr will trust him and they'll listen to him. And the third thing Jesus says, they will follow him. His sheep follow him by doing what? Well, by obeying his voice. When he says, come on, I'm going this way, the sheep go that way too. When he says, all right, we're turning right, the sheep turn right. They follow him. They obey him. They listen to him. They trust him. Therefore, they're willing to do what the shepherd says. Are you willing to do what the shepherd says? Now, a good shepherd is never going to give a bad command to his sheep, right? A good sheep wouldn't be like, hey, Herman, come along. Uh, I want you to go jump off this cliff. It'll be funny. A good shepherd's not going to do that, right? A good shepherd's going to be like, no, Herman, dummy, let's get away from that cliff. Let's go this way. He's going to keep that helpless Dumb, defenseless, dirty sheep from hurting himself. And if Herman has any sense at all, he's going to obey the good shepherd. See, whenever God tells you in his word to do something, he is telling you that for your own good. When God says, don't do this, he's essentially telling you, don't hurt yourself. And when he says, do that thing over there, what he's saying is, that's where you'll find life. That's where the best thing for you is. And if you trust him, you'll follow him. You'll do what he says. When we follow him, we end up on paths of righteousness. And when we go astray, we end up going our own way. The promises of Psalm 23 are ultimately for those who listen, trust, and follow Jesus. That's who Psalm 23 is ultimately look, written for. That's what David was ultimately pointing toward, as both a psalmist and a prophet. This is for those who have trusted in Jesus as their Savior, who have said, I know I'm a sinner and I need help. I need someone to wash me of my sin. 
That was Jesus. That's what he came to do. If you've never put your faith in him, then you are following a shepherd, but you're following a different one. A shepherd of money, of fame, of power, a shepherd of sex, a shepherd of control, a shepherd of wealth, a shepherd of fill in the blank. And all of them are going to lead you over a cliff because none of them are ultimately good shepherds. Only Jesus can say that he is the good shepherd. Only Jesus can say, as he did in John 10, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And then he says in the next verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Today, you can decide to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. If you've never made that decision, you can do it today and say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and the only way to God, that I am a sinner and my sin deserves death, and that you, Jesus, were the good shepherd who came to rescue me from sin and death. Now, maybe you're deciding to believe that today for the first time. If so, awesome. Let someone know that, either online or in person. Tell someone if that's your decision today. But for those of us who've maybe believed this for a long time, we can still decide to believe this again today, right? Faith is not a one-time thing we did way back then. Faith is an active, everyday activity because just as true of then is still true of us today, you can't shepherd yourself. You need Jesus as much today as on the first day you came to him because only if Jesus is your shepherd can we honestly say we lack nothing, Because there might be some people who say, well, no, I I actually have food and clothing. I have all my needs taken care of. Yes, but if you don't have Jesus, then the eternal thing is not taken care of. Only Jesus has eternal life, and he gives it to those who believe in him. I don't know about you, but I want Jesus to be my shepherd. I want to listen to him, to trust him, and to follow him. I want to stop trying to do things in my own power, going my own way. And experience tells me I need Jesus to be my shepherd. Scripture tells me I need Jesus to be my shepherd. Every Scot in heaven says, I laddie, you need Jesus, that was a terrible Scottish, <laughs> to be your shepherd. That is awful. I apologize to any Scottish people listening to this. When I follow Jesus, right, when I keep driver in the bag and I pull out the wedge, and do what he tells me to do, life goes so much better. The ball stays in the fairway. Might not go as far as I wanted it to, but things go better when we do things God's way, when I follow Jesus as my shepherd, when I trust him, when I listen to him and follow him. Now, after that fateful playoff hole in 1999 during the British Open, Jean Vandeveld, he held his composure for the crowds. He didn't break down in front of the people. But once he went into the scorer's tent, he buried his head in his hands, and he said, next time, I'll hit the wedge. You may call me a coward, but next time, I'll hit the wedge. You and me both, John. We need to give up our self-reliant ways if we want Jesus to be our shepherd. Let's pray together. Lord, we confess that you are the one that we need, that you are good. You are the good shepherd. You are a good father who has revealed himself to us in your son. You know what is best. Lord, you know, and we don't. And that's hard to admit sometimes when we want to play driver, but you're telling us to hit the wedge. Lord, we're so sorry for the many times we've chosen to go our own way, the times when we ignore your voice, we ignore your instructions. God, help us. We can't shepherd ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit in us to help us listen to you, trust you, help us to follow you all the days of our lives. And God, if there's anyone listening to this who's not yet put their faith in you, may today be that day. May they call on you, Jesus. May they make you the shepherd of their lives today. Would you call and lead every one of us home to you? We ask and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.